right, we're uh, continuing in the book of Ephesians. Last week, uh, we introduced the book, uh, talked about uh, the city of Ephesus and the importance of that city in the ancient world as a center of commerce and culture and religion, the place where the, where the temple of Diana uh, was and um, which was a, a center point uh, for uh, that ancient culture. And we talked about the church in that city <laughs> uh, established uh, by uh, Paul on his third missionary journey, probably started earlier with Aquila and Priscilla, but Paul uh, ministered there for upwards of three years and the gospel was sent throughout Asia Minor from that location. We went through a number of the amazing things that are recorded in the book of Acts during his time in uh, Ephesus. Um, and we also uh, talked about the importance of Ephesus in, in terms of the amount of writing that was either about or directed to that church in Ephesus. Obviously, we have the account of Paul's years there in the book of Acts, and then we have the record of his talking with the Ephesian elders at the end of his third missionary journey on his way to Jerusalem. After that, we have the letter written from prison. And then after his release, we have uh, two more letters that involve Ephesus because they were letters written to Timothy when he pastored at that church. And finally, we have some 30 years later, the Lord's evaluation of the church in Ephesus along with uh, six other churches uh, in uh, the book of Revelation. So it's a, it's a, significant, it's a significant place, both in uh, terms of the importance of the city, but more importantly, in terms of, of the church and all God did in and through that body of believers. Um, and, and now we're going to look at the letter itself. We briefly started it last time. And um, it is a, a very literally um, a treasure. In other words, the Bible is all a treasure. It, it, is, it is just uh, something that is precious beyond uh, words, almost beyond comprehension, that we can have the very truth and revelation of the God of the universe. But within that context, this little letter is a treasure. In fact, it's literally called by some the treasure house uh, of the Christian. God wants us to, um, to understand all that he has done and all that we possess in him. All the resources we have, all of the blessings we possess, because we are his, part of his great salvation. If you are struggling in life, and we all have struggles, right? This life is filled with struggles. But when you get down, or you get discouraged, or you're struggling in any way with trials, I would encourage you to spend time in this book, the book of Ephesians, <clears throat> because I believe it will rightly orient your thinking as you move in and through those difficult times. After his uh, initial short introduction, which we covered last time, Paul begins his letter this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is um, praise God. P praise God. Uh, he's going to tell us why we should be praising him, so let me just give you a little snapshot. In the first 14 verses of this letter, 
just the beginning part. You need to understand that this God needs to be praised and blessed because of all he has done and specifically all he has done for you and I who have come by faith in Jesus Christ. In those verses he says you have every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You have been chosen. Not everyone is. You have been predestined. Your destiny has been ordained to be with him. Because you are loved. And not only that, but you have been adopted into the family of God. And you've been redeemed, purchased with the price of his son's life. And you have been forgiven. You have been forgiven. And you've been sealed. You are secured. You are safe. And an inheritance awaits you in heaven. And you have this because of this magnificent plan of salvation that Paul's going to begin to open up to us in these first chapters of Ephesians. It is, it is a salvation that is brought about by your incomprehensible, majestic, Trinitarian God. You see, in verses 4 through 6, Paul says, this salvation is because God the Father chose you. Amen. In verses 7 through 12, it is only possible because God the Son redeemed you. And in verses 13 and 14, it is guaranteed and brought about by the Spirit who sealed you and secured you. You possess a salvation that spans all of eternity. It began before time was. before creation, before man, before the fall. And it's lived out in the present from the moment that you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is for now and it is for ever. It is for eternity. Do you see why Paul begins with praising God? Blessing God for his goodness, for his greatness, for all that he is. But specifically, he says... Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because in order to bring this great plan of salvation to fruition, he had to give his son. In order for this plan to be made possible, the son had to give his life. It is the Father and it is the Son who deserve to be blessed because they are the authors of this great salvation. Because of this great God, because of the work of His Son, you and I have been brought into union 
with Jesus Christ. Do you know what that means? It means you share his life. It means that you have his eternal life in you. And because you have his life, you have his riches. Because you have his riches, you have his resources. You are literally joint heirs with Jesus Christ. In addition, he grants you his peace, John 14 27 says, he grants you his joy, John 15, 11 says. Look, go with me to Colossians uh, 2, 10. It says in 9, for in him, Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And verse 10, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete. You have everything. Go with me to 2 Peter for a minute. Second Peter one verse three blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again brought us into union with granted eternal life to birthed us new made us new creations to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorrupted and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. That's First Peter. I did it again, didn't I? I knew that wasn't doing it. Listen. That was a good one. Because you have all of that. <laughs> Look, he says, 2 Peter 1, 3, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You have been made partakers of the divine nature, and you have, and here's the point, you have all things that pertain to life and godliness. So in Colossians it says you are complete in him, and in 2 Peter it says, and you have all things that you need for life and godliness. You are complete, you are perfect, you are given his righteousness, therefore you are secure for eternity, you are holy in the sight of God, and beyond that, you have everything you need to live. Amen. You are not only the, the beneficiaries of the salvation that saves you from condemnation and hell and takes you to heaven, but you have as a resource everything that you need for life and godliness in this life. You, um, you have him. You are in him. Uh, you do not need um, more love, more power, <laughs> and more of him in your life. Amen. You have that. Amen. Do do you understand that? Really important. You have that. What do you need? You need less of you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. The problem is not 
a lack of resources. The problem is we do not appropriate the resources that God has granted to us. You see these blessings, it says, are in the heavenlies. That's an interesting concept. It is, in fact, uh, the idea that your blessings are for you every place there is the realm of God, (laughs) which is everywhere. They are blessings that come from our God who is spirit, and they are blessings that are spiritual and beyond. But you need to understand some something. Everything is God's domain, but this place is in rebellion. And right now, you and I live in a hostile world set against God, filled with his enemies. We are sojourners through this foreign land. Now, in in terms of our rights and privileges, we have all the rights and privileges of a citizen of heaven because that's who we are. We are citizens of heaven. But just as if you were, um, in a human sense, a citizen of the United States and you were traveling in uh, a foreign country, you possess all the rights of your homeland, but you are in a different place. You are subject to their laws in some sense, and it is a foreign place to you. And this is a, this is a foreign place to us. We have, we have problems in experiencing all the blessedness that God has for us and that we actually possess because we are still humans and we still have sin that comes to us and resides in us. And we are under attack by Satan and his demonic forces and we live among people who are lost. Who are lost, just like we used to be and still set against God. So, in order for us to experience every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies which we possess, you must do it now in this time by and through the working of the Spirit of God. You can only experience the blessedness that God has granted you as you fully yield yourself to His Spirit who dwells in you. Galatians 5.16 familiar passage. I might get this right there. There's only one Galatians, not two. So So I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Walk under the control of the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God that leads and guides and empowers you in your living. That's all walking means. And then look, it says um, in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love and joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, All of those things are supernatural blessings that you possess because you have them irrespective of your circumstances. They're granted to you as the Spirit bears His fruit in and through and out of your life. They're part of the every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And there's more because in addition to that, He is your power, He is your wisdom. None of None of the life that we live as Christians can be lived apart from the power of the Spirit of God. And as we do that, as we yield ourselves to Him, then we can realize and see in our lives all of the blessedness that we have in this great salvation that we possess. So therefore, in order for us to experience the blessedness, we need to be sure that we're not grieving and quenching the Spirit of God in our life by sin that's with us, by disobedience, by moving away from where God wants us to go. Coming back then to verse 3, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Notice, It is all in Christ. 
everything that you're going to see, every blessedness that's talked about here and through, through all of this book is all there only in and because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as we said, it is in that union that you possess everything. Apart from that union, you possess nothing. That is the magnificence of the Christian faith. It, it drives out of the reality that we really are different and we really are in union with the triune God spiritually. That is a spiritual reality. This is not a religion of do's and don'ts. Not, not, a, not a religion just of ethics and propositions. This is a religion based upon the reality that we are in union with Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 4, in verse 4, the questions begin to be answered. Okay, what, when were these blessings, blessings confirmed? What, when did we get these blessings? How, how did it take place? On what basis did we get them? Well, he says, first of all, he chose us. He chose us. And when did he do it? Why, well, he did it before the foundation of the world. Before anything was. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever thought about that? You were placed in Christ before the foundation of the world. Hmm. Amazing. You were placed in Christ because He chose you. He chose you. What, what, what do you mean? Well, He did. He chose you. Oh, and, and, and why did he do that? Well, he, he chose you because that's what he wanted to do. Verse 5, he says, according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 11, he, he's obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purposes of him. Verse, verse 9, he says, according uh, to his good pleasure. Why did he choose you? Because that's what he desired to do. And, and it wasn't based on anything that you did. Um, look, um, it, it, in Romans chapter 5, well, let's go to chapter 9 first. Romans chapter 9, verse 15. just to kind of drive the point home. 15 and 16, he says, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have co compassion on whomever I will have compassion. <clears throat> so then, it is not of him who wills. It's not based on what you desire, not your desire. Nor of him who runs, or by your effort but of God who shows mercy. It is God who sovereignly chooses not based upon the object, but based upon his own will and for his own purposes. Romans 5 says he chose us when we were enemies. He chose us when we were sinners. He chose us because this great salvation is all about Him. And as we'll see, it's all for His glory. His sovereign choice is all through the New Testament. It, it says we are appointed to eternal life. It says we are elect. It says we are predestined. And it says we are chosen. And over and over and over again it says, and never because of anything in us. Always because of him. And yet, and yet, all men are offered salvation. All men are offered salvation and all men and women are responsible 
to accept it and will be judged if they don't. All men are offered. Jesus says, I will not I will not cast out any who come. Anyone who comes can be saved. But they must be chosen. So how can you reconcile God's sovereign choice with man's responsibility? You can't. So don't. Just know that salvation belongs to God because turn with me to Isaiah 42. And verse 8, he says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. Salvation is all about the glory of God. In verse 6, he says, why does he do it? To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Salvation is so that all can be witness to the manifold goodness and greatness of our God in saving such sinners as us. All things are for his glory and salvation Salvation is one of the preeminent things for his glory. He says, he says look, um, what is his purpose in saving us? Well, back in verse 4, he says, um, he says that we should be holy. That, that, he, he's doing this to make us holy. The, the only way that we, we can be holy is if he makes us holy because we can't be holy on our own. Holy and without blame, righteous before him, righteous because of Christ, righteous because we possess Christ's righteousness. And what was his motive for doing it? Why, in verse 4 it says, it, 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 sometimes it may be better to put a period after the word him in verse 4 without blame before him. It doesn't have to be there, but it, it, it may read this way. Blame, blame, excuse me, we should be holy and without blame before him, period, in love having predestined us to adoption. So the salvation is to make us holy, and the reason that he needs to make us holy is because he loved us and he loved us with a perfect love, not an emotional love, not a love based upon what was lovable in us, but a love because he is love. That's what First John says. And love is manifest by giving. And God gave the most, the highest price. His love is evidenced by the gift of his son to die for us. And then, then, then the result. The result is, in verse 5, you've been adopted as sons into the family of God. You've entered into that intimate relationship that only he could bring about. You, 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 have, you have been invited into the presence of up into the lap of the holy, righteous king of the universe. The one of whom scripture says is a consuming fire. The one who scripture says it is fearful to fall into the hands of the living God. But because of this great salvation that began at eternity past and never ends and is ushered in by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, 
because of that salvation that God chose you into by his sovereign right and privilege, because of that great salvation, you are brought into the presence of your Father. And you possess every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time today. Thank you for this amazing truth. And we just scratched the surface of it, Lord. Help us to contemplate, meditate on the reality of what you have done in this great salvation, where it began, and the reality that it will never end that we are, by your mercy, granted it, not because of any merit in us, but because you, in your great love, have chosen to love us. And to do that, you had to give your son. You had to send him to die on the cross, Lord, that we might be forgiven, that we might be redeemed, and that we might be made your children and that we might be granted every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in him. Lord, it humbles us, and it makes us grateful. And that's the basis for our living, Lord. Help us to do it by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.